All right, so now let's talk about experiment terminology. So when we say it's a true experiment, what I really mean is that we really did use the experimental research strategy. And that means manipulation and control, right? Now, sometimes uh, people will just say, oh, this test was done in a lab, it was an experiment. But that doesn't necessarily um, mean that they use the experimental research strategy. So you have to check for that. What we call all other studies that seem like, you know, like they're using some research and collecting data with variables and all of that stuff, we call all of those a study. So if it's, it's a correlational uh, design, can it be an experiment? No, it can only be a study. Um, whereas an experiment can actually also be called a study, right? So you just have to be careful about how you use those words from now on. Also, um, one important idea, one important uh, new piece of terminology is the independent variable. This is the manipulated variable, categorical variable, in an experiment. Right? So that variable, we're going to give it a special name because we talk about it frequently. We're going to call that the IV or independent variable. The variable that you're interested in measuring the outcome of, that's called the dependent variable. Measuring outcome with dv. Right? So this is how we measure the outcome of an experiment or a study. Um, and that's called a dependent variable. Um, factors, that's just a different name for independent variables. So you might have two factors, that means you had two IVs. You might have three factors, that means you had three IVs, right? So factor is just another name for IV. Treatment conditions are the different situations caused by manipulating that IV. So once you have an IV, you'll end up with multiple treatment conditions. Often, uh, at least one treatment one group that gets something special, for instance, getting a radio, right? Versus the control condition, where they don't get anything. Nothing is done to them. So the control condition, sometimes um, they just don't have anything else. Um, often in medical studies, you might see randomized trials, where that means they did random assignment, for patients to get into the treatment condition where they get some sort of special drug. But the other group, they don't go into the control condition, they go into what we call the placebo condition. So one group will get a pill that actually works, uh, well, that actually has some sort of effect. The other group gets sugar pills, just so that it's not just the effect of believing like, oh, this will help me, you know, and, uh, in order to rule that out. So placebo conditions um, are very similar to controls, except that they do get something, it's just that that thing is chemically inert, so like sugar or something. Uh, levels um, of an IV is the same thing as treatment conditions. So in this IV, we have two levels. So we have this level and that level, right? So um, it's another way of saying different conditions of IV. And confounds or extraneous variables, these are those, exp uh, those variables that you don't measure necessarily, um, but affect your DV. So these affect dv, but they're not part of the, your study. But not part of study design. So those are what we call confounds or extraneous variables. All right. So sometimes you might hear the terminology that this is a blind experiment. So this means that participants in the study, they don't know what the conditions are, and they don't know what the condition they're in. Participants do not know what condition they are in. 
So um, this is often a terminology, uh, a piece of terminology that you hear in uh, in medical studies, where patients are are blind. Uh, they don't they don't mean that they're literally blind, like they can't see. It just means that they don't know which condition they're in. They don't know whether they're in the treatment condition or the placebo condition. Um, Double-blind experiments take it one step further. Not only do the participants not know, but also the, um, the research team that's administering, uh, that's interacting with the participants, those people don't know either. But also research team that interacts with participant don't know what condition participant is in. So for instance, let's say um, I am like the pharmacist who gives out the medication. So the medication might already be labeled with the person's name. I don't know what's inside of it. I don't know if the placebo is inside of it or the um, the drug is actually inside of it. So, so when I interact with the participants and give them instructions and I say, oh, you want to take this, you know, two times a day. You definitely don't want to drink milk if you're, you know, taking this medication. Um, then my interaction with the participant is the same regardless of whether they're in the uh, placebo condition or the drug condition, right? So those are called double-blind experiments. Uh, double-blind experiments are also important in psychology, where um, often research assistants who administer the study don't know what condition the participant is in. So the computer or some other recording system will record uh, which condition that the participant is in, but the, um, but the experimenter doesn't know. Now, usually the person who's in charge of the entire thing, they know what condition everybody's in. But, um, but the people interacting with the participants need to be blind in order to have a double-blind experiment. All right. So finally, let's summarize how categories are related to statistics. So in category one, in descriptive studies, usually all you can do is summarize data which we know how to do, or visualize using things like histograms and, um, you know, box plots and all kinds of things. But in correlational studies, what you can do is also summarize and visualize data. You could still do that. So summarize and visualize. But now you could also um, analyze your data with regressions, because this is part of summary, and find correlations. Right? So now you could uh, um, apply those as well to correlational studies. Now, with experimental, quasi-experimental, and non-experimental designs of category three, obviously you could summarize and visualize, but we can't necessarily use regression lines because regression and correlation are saved for when you're interested in two continuous variables. Right now, we have multiple variables, but one of them is categorical, and we haven't learned to deal with those yet. Um, so, we're going to be learning them in the next, uh, next lesson, um, eventually in the next lessons. We have to set up some probability ideas in advance. But um, we're going to be learning about things like t-tests and f-tests and chi-squares. And these are going to depend on probability um, some probability principles, so we're going to cover those first, but then we're going to go on and talk about these analyses later on. Let's move on to some examples. So example one, an educational psychologist found a significant relationship between college students' grade point average and their parents' annual income. Students with affluent parents 
had higher grade point averages than students with poorer parents. She concluded that a student's level of academic success depends on how much money the student's parents earn. What research strategy was used? Well, we know that grade point average is continuous and annual income is continuous, so this must be category two correlational. What statistical analyses were probably conducted? Um, this sounds like um, this sounds like a positive relationship, and so that seems like it's a correlation. So something like R, right? Is this conclusion warranted? Ah, this is an important question. Here she says. The academic success depends on the money from their parents. Depends on. That's a causal word. Now, you have to be careful because a lot of times people won't just come out and say straight up, this causes this, right? There's a lot of different ways of saying causes, impacts, effects, right? Depends on is one of those code words for causality. Is it true that money causes academic success? Well, in a correlational design, can you look at causality? No. No. Why? Because there's the third variable problem. Right? So it might be other things. For instance, their parents might have a, a really, good, uh, really good work ethic let's say, um, and because of that, they have higher incomes. Um, and maybe they instilled that work ethic in their children, so their children have higher grade point averages. So that might be one explanation of a third variable, work ethic, that really explains it. Another thing might be that the parent's income um, gives these kids access to extra tutoring. And so it's really the tutoring that helps their um, grade point averages. Um, and so if they had free tutoring available, then maybe this relationship would just go away. Um, another thing might be that uh, maybe parents' income is affected by, you know, uh, by their ability to delay gratification, right? And so they have these values about delaying gratification and how education delays gratification. And um, maybe because of that, these college students have been raised in a household where delaying gratification has been uh, highly valued. And because of that, they're able to say, oh, no, I'm not going to drink because I'm going to take my final tomorrow. And so they can delay gratification. So it might be that these third variables are at play. Um, probably directionality is not as big of an issue because probably income is um, not quite affected by their, their students' scores. Um, GPA, affecting parent income, that's a harder link to sort of imagine. So I would say that's probably not likely to be the case. All right, example two. A psychologist wanted to compare children in the first, third, and fifth grade on their persistence on a difficult task. What kind of research design is this? Well, they want to know about two variables. Variable one is um, age or, or grade level, right? And variable two is persistence, right? And so um, this is a categorical variable. And maybe persistence, they might uh, measure it by saying, uh, time spent on a difficult task. So it's like a really hard puzzle, but they look at how long kids spend on it, right? So maybe time spent. And if that's the case, that's a continuous variable. So we know that we're in category three, right? But um, is this an experiment? Okay. Is this categorical variable manipulated? Did the experimenter sort of control it? And is, every, is everything except for age controlled for? Um, no, that is not the case. They did not randomly assign these children to be these ages, right? Um, 
that children weren't made to be instantaneously older. They didn't start off the same age and one was just magically made older, right? So it's not um, experimental. It's not quasi-experimental. It's not really pre-post. It's not really close to an experiment. I would say this is non-experimental. Right? And um, can we conclude that age, or rather life experience, causes persistence? No, not necessarily. It might be that somehow the third grade curriculum causes persistence, or maybe it's uh, time spent in school causes persistence, right? So um, there might be all these other variables involved, and so uh, we don't necessarily know that um, age causes persistence. So, no <laughs> to causality. It's not that age doesn't cause persistence. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that we don't know. We can't say that it does or doesn't. Example three, a biologist wanted to know whether complex sugars can sustain life longer than simple sugars. She prepares six petri dishes, each containing 10 leafhopper in uh, insects. Two dishes are assigned to the control group, and two are assigned to simple sugars, and two are assigned to complex sugars. So she took two dishes and put nothing in one. She put some simple sugars in two of them. She put some complex sugars in the other two. The DV is the time it takes for half of the leafhopper insects to die. All right, so what are the cases? Well, are the cases the leafhoppers? No because what we're looking for is how fast um, the leafhoppers, half of the leafhoppers die, so five of the leafhoppers die. So it's not about the leafhoppers themselves. It's actually about the dishes, the petri dishes, right? Each of those is a case, and for each of those petri dishes, um, they're going to have a dependent variable, how long uh, the leafhoppers uh, how long it took for half of the leaf, hop leaf hoppers to die. So uh, what is the sample size? The sample size is six dishes. And is this an experiment? Yes, it is. Presumably, these dishes all started off the same, and then two were randomly, like, it's not that the two were special, but two were randomly assigned to have uh, nothing. Two were randomly assigned to artificially, by the experimenter, the experimenter put, um, simple sugars in it, and then the experimenter put complex sugars in the other one. So this is an experiment, yes. Example four, if you wanted to test the hypothesis that hamsters who are raised in less daylight have higher hormone concentrations than hamsters raised in more daylight, what would you do to show that daylight exposure causes hormone concentrations to increase? Well, what you would want to do is first start off with hamsters that were all raised sort of similarly. Start with similar hamsters. So maybe I'll get a hundred hamsters that were raised sort of similarly with sort of the same amount of daylight, right? Um, and I would randomly assign these hamsters to two groups. And one of the groups I would raise in less daylight, and the other group would get more daylight. And I would measure as the, and so daylight is the, uh, so the IV is daylight exposure, so how much daylight they get. But the DV that I'm interested in is their hormone concentrations. So once they're in these two groups, and I now I change the way that they're raised. One gets more daylight, one gets, or one gets less daylight, one gets more. Um, then I would measure their hormone concentrations and see if there have been any changes. All right, so that's uh, research strategies. Join us next time on educator.com.